mix and match types. Great. Okay, so let's get started. So we last week went over word to vec which is a simple or a shallow neural net model where we are uh, using one input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. So let's take that one step further now and add more layers to create a deep learning model. Okay. And we also used those encodings and embedded encoding to help us predict new information. Now the nice thing about these deep learning models is that you can build that all into the model. So you don't have to extract from word, like we do from word to vec, where we have to like collapse over documents. In a deep learning model, you can actually program that directly. And you could do it in a shallow model, you just can't do it with word to vec. Right? So the, the beauty of word to vec and fast text is the way that they're encoded, which then allows you to extract the um, matrix from it. To do stuff with, but deep learning models, you can encode them to predict a specific output rather than just the words. Now, the question I always have when people tell me how excited they are about deep learning is what do I seek to gain by using deep learning? Right? So, what is it that means that this is a better model than LSA or a better model than? Um, word to vec. So just making sure that the, the extra computing power is worth the trouble. Let me close one drive here because it has a tendency to blow up my computer. All right, there we go. <clears throat> so what are we gaining from using deep learning? Okay. Because it does uh, take a lot of extra computation. Now, I can make these models run on my computer with small data sets, but often they're very, um, sometimes if you have an older computer, they just won't run, or Keras won't install. And so on our particular server, we don't really have the, that's not, what is it, the joke is that it's made of gum and glues, you know, paper clips. Um, it isn't really built for these types of models. So having, you you know, the first restriction that we have is that we either have to spin up a virtual machine, like with Amazon's um, systems, uh, or you have to have a good machine to make these run. Okay. So that's one restriction for them already. Okay. Now a couple types. We talked about convolutional neural nets and uh, recurrent neural nets. So a convolutional neural net is meant to mimic the visual cortex. And so we talked about this last week. The brain is this tiered, complex, beautiful thing that has all these different sections that do different pieces of process, cognitive processing. And the visual cortex is here in the back, which evolutionarily makes a lot of sense. Like your eyeballs are here in the front, but the part that does the visual processing is in the back. And, you know, when I used to teach... Um, just a straight cognitive science course, people would be like, that doesn't make sense. Why isn't it right here in the front? Well, if you bunk your head really hard, you um, are less likely to black out because the part of the brain that's sending you visual signals um, didn't get hit. But this is why you will black out if you get in a car accident because you hit the back of your brain and it just basically wipes the, the, the whiteboard that your brain was writing on. Okay. Um, it also allows for a lot of cool processing that occurs uh, in the parietal lobe up here. Okay. And so one thing we know about the visual cortex is that it has all these layers and there each layer responds to a specific type of input. So this here represents the type of, of edge detector that you might see. So we have neurons that respond specifically to certain slants right? um, on the left and right visual field. So what we can do with a deep learning model is represent kind of that path with a lot of extra layers, hidden layers that we don't, you know, we know they do things, but we're not entirely sure. So the path from the front to the back is fairly well known, but there's plenty of spots where we just don't like it. Well, who knows what it's doing there? It's doing something, but who knows what? Um, and so CNNs have been very popular in image processing, especially. And one that make, some, what that makes them a CNN or convolutional network is that all of the layers are fully connected, meaning every node is connected to every other node. Okay. 
And so what you end up with is imagine these are the layers. So we're going to have multiple sets of nodes. Um, and we could build them like they're, they're layered like this because it's supposed to look like a picture, but just think lots of different bubbles with words in them. And uh, let's say we're activating this part of the picture. And so it turns on a little section of those nodes in that hidden layer. And then by using what's called max pooling, it sort of averages across all these different layers and uh, creates the probability of the output. Okay. And so what, what's happening is between layers, everything is connected. Now, some of those connections might be zero, okay. but everything is allowed to be connected to everything else, which in a, a language sense makes a lot of sense. And then through kind of whatever mathematical transforms you pick and what types of layers you have, max pooling is usually applied, which allows us to kind of pool all of those different contexts and create some sort of output layer that in this scenario is picking what's in the picture. But for word choice, it might be um, what word comes next. It might be uh, uh, the, the type of document it is, so you can build this as a classification task. Uh, you don't even need to add any extra machine learning algorithms. You could just build the task in directly. Um, you know, it could be almost anything as your output. Okay. And so, depending on the types of layers, is kind of the type of algorithm you're going to choose. And so, these models are often often used what's called back propagation to learn. And we talked a very briefly about backprop last week. But essentially what happens is the, the inputs are put into the front of the model. It runs through all of the layers, whatever they are, okay, and then picks a specific output. That output is either correct or incorrect, okay, because it's a bind, some sort of binary classification. Not binary. Um, uh, well, it's binary in the sense that it's yes, it's correct, or it's not. But the, the output layer might have 15 different options, right? So you don't have to have only two options. You can have many options. But it boils down to, yes, that classification was correct, or no, it was not. Okay. And uh, the backprop part is it figures out, OK, I got it right. So I'm going to circle back and strengthen all of the weights in the model that helps me get to this answer because I got it right. So those are strengthened. And that works a lot like the brain. There's a very famous phrase, things that fire together, wire together. And what that means is that neurons that frequently cause each other to activate or fire, it's a gun terminology, um, it becomes easier for them to loop. So it's kind of like uh, knocking over dominoes. Right? The dominoes get closer and closer together, so if one of them falls over, they all fall over. Okay. If you get the answer wrong, it circles back so, and lessens all those weights because you got it wrong. Okay. And that sort of, of adjustment sometimes is called loss. Right? So models that have a lot of loss are learning a lot. Okay. Models that have very low loss values, close to zero, uh, the weights aren't adjusting anymore. It's not learning anything. And we'll see loss here later in the lecture. And this is sometimes called shaping, which is an old behaviorism term, where you're slowly shaping what you want the model to do. You do this with people and animals, right? You're just slowly training them um, to get the right connections in place. Sometimes people call this tuning. Um, I think, you know, shaping reminds me of like behaviorism and B.F. Skinner. Tuning reminds me of guitars, so whichever. A visual image is your favorite. Until you get the right pieces in the right place. Uh, and then we just talked about loss. So loss is the amount of change that occurs in each round. So if a model continuously has large loss values, it's not really learning. It's like constantly confused, basically. Um, what you should see is a cross training. Okay. You should see those loss values uh, decrease, usually exponentially, but not always. They should decrease and then ask them to level out. And when you hit that point, no more training is necessary. And you don't want to overtrain these models um, because then they won't generalize. Right? They'll only know the things that you showed them.
And so here's a really great tutorial about understanding convolutional neural nets where I took some of their pictures. So uh, if you need to come back to this. Another type of model is a recurrent model. Uh, I think more current models are just like practically more common. Like I feel like I see them more in code, but sometimes when people are doing a CNN, they're actually really doing an RNN. So it's easy to kind of mix and match these and combine them together. Um, so they're not one or the other, but they it depends on what kind of layers you put in, which one you're doing. So you could do a, a hybrid model that has both. The big key for convolutional network is that the layers are fully connected. Okay. The big thing for a recurrent network is uh, memory or sequencing. Okay. So this one on here on the left sometimes is called a vanilla network. And this is more of a convolutional style if all of your things connected with one set of inputs, one set of hidden layers, multiple, and one set of outputs. It's one to one. It's one instance to one output. And it forget it doesn't forget between because you've trained and tuned the numbers, but it loses the information about the last trial. Okay. Now when I think about language, that doesn't make any sense because we remember what the last word was, or the last several words were, right? Or the last paragraph, depending on the level of abstraction. Okay. And so you might have a one to many. Here's the current input, but here are the last two things I saw. Okay, many to many, here are the last three inputs, um, or many to one, rather, one output, many to many. Uh, so there's like lots of ways to make these combinations. But generally, um, in a recurrent model, you're gonna have some sort of mini time piece here, where they're in the green section. Okay. And those are usually the sequence of events that one has seen, or uh, maybe in some of these picture models, you know, a set of common pixels, like it's easier to think about with words, right? It's the last set of words that you saw. Okay. But that can be converted for all kinds of tasks. Okay. So the left side here is a vanilla network because it's one to one. And then the right side are the more complex sequences. Okay. So it's about the sequence of inputs. And it's the recurrent part. And so some of the terminology you'll see are long, short-term memories. And the first time I heard this as like a cognitive science, I was like, do what now? <laughs> You're kidding, right? Because short-term memory is, or sometimes working memory, people argue over this, but generally um, is the sort of memory that you have or you're currently working with, like the things you're thinking about right now. Long-term memory is everything you could be thinking about. And vastly simplifying this. And so I'm like, how is it long short term memory? I don't understand. But the idea is that it's short term memory because you only have so many pieces of information. But in a recurrent model, um, it's long because you are hanging on to the last several trials. So you have the current trial and the last several trials that you might pull from memory. But this is a specific type of layer that you can add um, as one of your hidden layers and uh, they're very popular for making recurrent models. So you'll see sometimes people call these like um, uh, long short-term memory models. What they're really talking about is a specific type of RNN. And they use backpropagation to learn. I would say backpropagation is like the most popular way of learning but uh, when you have multiple time points, so to speak, you have to kind of backprop through time, I think is the example. Um, I don't have it written down here, but, um, oh, it's right here. Backprop through time, right? Uh, often called gradient descent. Right? Now, gradient descent's a couple of different things, but in these kind of models, it's like it uses the last several trials to tune those weights or a global optimization procedure. And so there's a really great RNN tutorial here. <clears throat> what can I do with this stuff? Well, I swear to you, I, I, I don't know if it's just because of the field I'm in or the people I follow on Twitter, but I just feel like people are obsessed with deep learning right now. It's like the catchphrase, right? Like um, 
AI, machine learning, and deep learning, and I'm just like, it's still just math. Like, but they have a lot of really good uses. Okay, so speech recognition. We talked about Google's deep learning um, machine that does runs Google Translate, right? Uh, lots of general language models can be used through deep learning. Um, it's very popular for image recognition and classification and text generation. So a couple of years ago, maybe there was this like thing going around on Twitter that was like, I trained a bot on a thousand word plays and here's the script it wrote for the new Batman or something dumb and people were making up jokes. But you could actually do that. I have a very bad example at the end of the lecture here because it does not have nearly enough training inputs and it's actually really messy. But um, I have a, like a simple example that will run <laughs> in a reasonable amount of time. Okay. If you try to run these lecture notes um, on your own machine, if your machine is can handle them, uh, it does take 30 to 60 minutes to run, depending. So these are slow. Uh, okay, so I feel like we talked about this. Maybe I'm remembering a different class, but I feel like I've talked about their machine translation system. But if I haven't, let me tell you right now because it's so fascinating. But um, Google Translate, for as much as people like to talk about translation fails, because it does do weird fails, uh, is kind of an amazing system. So in 2016, they switched to a deep learning model for machine translation. So that was not terribly long ago and really pushed the like boundaries of what these kind of models can do. Now, to be fair, Google probably has the largest data set in existence. They are the largest data set in existence. And so AM probably has some of the best computers in existence, you know, IBM, um, IBM's Watson, maybe notwithstanding, but and so what it does, part of it's a trade secret, but part of what they've written about is that it takes into account the context, so that's a recurrent neural net model, to help with translation. Because many translation fails are due to the, to the kind of, the, not slang, I mean slang is a problem, but like the, the cultural way we speak, right? So there's the very formal, sort of, if you want to talk about English, but formal kind of language that you might write in. But then there's the way we actually talk, right? And those two things don't match many times. Because of the polysemes and the synonymian words where we have things that when combined together have a different meaning than when used individually. And so any kind of model that's going to capture that kind of cultural context of language um, uh, has to account for context. And so I find, I find this amusing sometimes when you get on Amazon and you are um, looking at a product or whatever and you can tell that they've just translated it from the original language to English or vice versa, whatever. Um, because the phrasing is so funny. So like, um, especially I feel like when it comes from Chinese, it has like these like really funny phrases that you're just like, what Google Translate did you use? I have no idea what you're trying to say. And I imagine it's, it's funny the other way too. I, I'm fully aware that English is a silly language sometimes. And so those kind of, of things that were like, it translates, but you can, and that's, what, what, what are you trying to say? And so we've recently run into this on a big project where we've translated our consent form, right? We're doing research. So we've got to ask people if they want to take our study. And we were trying to explain, um, you'll either get course credit, like extra credit points or compensation, real money for taking the study. And somehow in Russian, that translated to like, you will receive an exam at the end. And so one of our, our folks who was helping us with Russian was like, I don't think this is what you mean. And we were like, nope, <laughs> that is not what we mean. So having to, to find those, that sweet spot, right, is really difficult. Okay. Now, what is amazing to me about Google system, um, knowing what I know about the brain, is that it's what's called a zero shot translation. So one shot translation is when you translate from
from language number one to language number two to language number three because you or the model has never seen one and three. Okay. And this happens a lot when we have models that have been trained on, let's say, English to Spanish, English to Spanish, English to Spanish. Okay, it's got that down. Okay. But, um, you know, if it needs to go from English to Italian and it's never seen that, it would go English to Spanish and then Spanish to Italian. That would be one shot. This is one hop, one stop in the middle. A zero shot model can switch between languages that it has never seen any training for. Okay. So a direct translation between any two languages, no need to stop in the middle, even if you've never seen that connection. And I just like cannot emphasize enough how freaking amazing that is because <clears throat> and we designed these deep learning models thinking about the brain. Okay. And humans don't do this. Okay. We do not have the skill or capability. It's pretty rare. Okay. So, um, for example, this is um, called transfer of learning. Being an expert in one thing does not make you an expert in another thing. Okay. So being very good at baseball does not make you very good at soccer. And most people can only name one or two athletes that were very good at multiple multiple sports. So you would think that would allow you, you're extra athletic, you can do things, right? But no. Um, and you see this too, like uh, knowing one romance language does not mean you know all of them, right? Or if you're, you know, for coding folks, knowing one language does not mean you suddenly can pick up JavaScript, because I wish I could. But I hate JavaScript, <laughs> so I, you know, sit there and glare at it. Very sinister, and it glares back. Okay. Uh, so a zero-shot translation is just really amazing. Okay. And then there's some new work with GPT-3, which is a mouthful, by OpenAI that looks like it's doing very similar things, where I've watched some people do some demos where they just say, write me a program that converts x to y and it just writes it and it just like it's blowing my mind how amazing this thing is um similar type of thing okay zero shot translation and why that's amazing just to finalize this point is it shows that the model is learning implicitly and transfer learning which humans do not do very well now we do implicitly learn very well okay? implicit learning is something we're good at as we can see by all the stereotyping and biases that have come, you know, are very clear right now and you know all the time. But um, transfer learning is something we don't do very well. Okay. So it's very cool that we've written models that do things that we can't do based on our own kind of programming. So you can learn more about Google's zero shot translation and their neural network from some blog posts that they had from their AI group. So how do I set one of these up? Okay, so we're going to use Keras. Okay. Keras requires temp TensorFlow. Okay. Now you can do all of this in R. There is a Keras package in R, but it still requires that you use <laughs> TensorFlow. And all it does is talk to Python. So, you know, I just did the whole thing in Python because we've been using Python for a while, and hopefully you guys are a little bit more comfortable with it. Okay. Uh, but you can do this stuff in R. It's the same basic code. Um, you just write it in R style instead of Python style. So you would need TensorFlow as well. And then you may have to install that with administrative capabilities. Um, I ran into this problem when I tried to put it on the server, but our server just like, is like, I can't handle this. So, because like I said, gum, gum, popsicle sticks and push pins or uh, paper clips. Um, so that's why I don't have you running one of these models. Okay. Plus they take a long time. Okay. I know that in machine learning too, um, they have you guys do some of these types of models. So if you're really interested in this sort of thing, I think that's where that gets covered a lot more. Okay. And then there's some computation area that they give you that will run these. So let's look at Kara specifically. So I'm going to try to predict sentiment. Uh, I do more sentiment in the other class because it used to be called sentiment analysis. Thankfully now is named 
appropriately, NLP. Um, but that's something we haven't covered this semester, so let's see if we can predict sentiment. Now, the type of model we're going to run is a sequential model for both of these, and that means that it is run in sequence, right? So, layer one, layer two, layer three. Dense is a type of layer where you're connecting all the neurons, like for a CNN. LSTM is a, the long short term memory for a recurrent model. And then let's try. All right. So from Keras, I'm going to import the sequence. And then I'm going to add, and so it's going to tell me PS, I'm using TensorFlow. Great. I'm going to add a sequential layer. I'm sorry, a sequential model. Um, and then import the dense layer, an embedding layer. So embedding layers are pretty much necessary for kind of building the structure of the model. Uh, LSTM layer. And then we're also going to use the IMDB data set. Because it's an easy um, sentiment data set. Right. So max features here. How many features do I want to use? Right. So how many? Um, notes do I want to have? Let's start with a thousand. We can play with this. Obviously, bigger numbers take longer to run. Maximum length is the size of the sequences you're interested in, so we're going to go 15. And batch size is just the size of the training batches. So it breaks it up into runs, which are called epics, and it just says how big, how many um, feature chunks do you want in each batch. Okay, 32 is a very popular number, and I will tell you that while well, I have done a couple of these, this is like definitely, um, not, I'm not like an expert in these for show. And there are many times that I ask my expert friend, like, why, why this number? He's like, I don't know, it just is. So I'll tell you that 32 is a very popular batch size. Many of these numbers sort of mimic gram numbers, like 128, 64, 32, they're kind of popular that way. Um, and they're changeable. So manipulate at will. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to load up this data set. Now it's built into, into Keras and has a very weird specific format. <clears throat> so this, I'm sorry, back up. This, this, this code here is specific to this data set. Okay. Um, and you know, you've got to figure out for yourself how do you want to clean that data? Do you want to take out the stop words? Do you want to spell check it? Do you want to make sure you remove all the Latin characters? So you could use gensums. Um, well, simple preprocess is going to give you tokenized sets, which you don't need. Um, I don't think. But you know, you can use the code that we've already written to help you break the data set into. I mean, clean up the data set. That's what I'm looking at. Go away. Bottom. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build my data set into training and testing, okay, and that's from scikit-learn. But here, um, the data set's already built that way. So I could use this test tra train test split like we did in log regression to break this stuff up. Okay. All right. And so I have grabbed the training data, grabbed the testing data. So I have a thousand training sequences and a thousand test sequences. Uh, I could move more into the train and less in the test. That would be fine, too. But I will tell you that models, when you use testing data on them, still are learning. So the parameters are still tuning when they see new data sets. And that's fine, because when you experience new information, you're still learning. All right. So this pad sequence option just allows us to make sure that each piece is the same length. So what we're basically building is um, a one hot table okay, of those sequences and um, you know when they're on or off. So we have our maximum number of features right? and we have each of the sequences and you just have this kind of table that says this is the sequence and it's on for this one and off for that one, on for this one and off for that one. So pad sequences helps us make that shape. So you'll see now that we have 1,000 okay, by 15. And that's partially due to the choices that we made back here. Okay. 
So it's got to input the same kind of structure as what the model is expecting. But that is totally tweakable. So you could um, change that if you want. So let's build a sequential model now. And so we'll say, we're going to build a sequential model. These are very popular. Okay. Then let's add the layers to the model and build them in order that we want them in. The embedding layers is kind of our feature set. Okay. We could use word to vec We could use the other vector spacers as our feature set. We could use this one hot table that we just built. Okay. So the embedding layer is kind of depends on like how you're wanting to encode the data. Okay. We just built our own kind of simple um, uh, bag of words kind of method. The long short term memory layer is going to help the model remember what we're going to ask x many parameters. Okay. And this is in the y128. And I remember, Jonathan, y128. <laughs> I don't know, it works good. Everybody uses it. Okay, why? <laughs> it does. Okay, so feel free to manipulate this parameter as well. Um, because I don't, I don't have a good answer <laughs> on why, why some of these defaults work, but you know they're great. The great thing about defaults is they're ch they're changeable, right? so you can tune them. Then we'll add a dense layer which connects the long short-term memory layer to an output using sigmoid activation. More on that in a minute. And so activation, um, remember from our discussion last week, is how. Um, it knows what to turn on and off. So activation in the brain is when a neuron lights up or fires. Okay, or a chemical process, neurochemical process is happening. Okay, electrochemical is what I'm trying to say. In these models, it's determining what is off and on. Okay. So you know, if this one's on, it has some sort of connection to the output, the probability outputs. And it, and it says, okay, that one being on is strong enough to turn this one on or not. So these are like light switches. They're either on or off, but the probability of their connection is what we're tuned. All right, so here's what a one looks like. So the code's not terribly scary, honestly. So we're going to build a sequential model. We're going to add to that model an embedding layer. So this is where we're putting in our features. Next layer we're going to add is a long short term memory layer. Okay. And so our 128 tier match. Dropout is about, I think this is in percent. Um, that is things that you forget. Okay. Now, no one remembers things perfectly. There are people who are super rememberers and they have what sometimes is called didactic or photographic memory. That's, they're just very good at memorizing things. Um, no one remembers everything. So. It's helpful to program models that forget things, okay. and at a certain rate. Okay, so we've got dropout and our recurrent dropout. Okay. And the nice thing about this is that then you're not overtraining models quite so easily because they've forgotten some things. And so when they see the training again, it might be new okay, or it might be reinforced, but we don't have just sort of like perfect memory because then the only thing it'll learn is the connection between those two events and it won't generalize. Then we're going to add a dense layer with an, a sigmoid activation. Right. So remember that um, sigmoid here right, is this sort of sine curve okay. and that's because we're expecting things to be on or off. Okay, It is either this or that and so this is kind of like using a, a logistic regression. And so the, the kind of Final pieces of the model depend on the type of, of thing you are doing. So let me make that a little bit clearer. When we compile the model, the loss <clears throat> function is still based on the type of data that we have. And in this model, we have um, <clears throat> one second, I'll get back to that. Um, either positive or negative because we're predicting sentiment. Right, and so that is a binary function, hence the sigmoid activation. We'll see a different one in a minute. So binary cross entropy makes sense because it's binary and there's two outputs. 
Um, the uh, optimizer is Adam. This is a very popular optimizer as well. I have not played with these, so that's my best suggestion. And then I also wanted to tell me about the accuracy of the model. So remember the accuracy here is simply how many of the outputs were correct. Okay, back to your question. Dropout versus recurrent dropout. So I think a dropout is the, I'm pretty sure, dropout's like the current activation dropout. So here are all the, the nodes that are on and we're going to lose a certain amount of this. Recurrent dropout is the previous steps. Kind of forgetting. So we're forgetting, like as we're listening, right, you imagine you hear, you forget some of the words that you've just heard, but then if you are trying to remember the something someone said two trials ago or two minutes ago, you've also lost some of those words. Right? And so this piece here is kind of a fade out of those previous things that you've seen. Does that answer your question? Perfect. All right. Uh, did I get everything here? Yes. So all models have to have loss and optimization. Hey, I would say that loss here is heavily tied to the choice here. Okay. <clears throat> Now, this data set is large, so I cut it down in size just so this would run in a reasonable amount of time because, you know, bigger data sets take longer to run. And while I have a fairly good computer, it, you know, I don't have all day for these data sets to run for examples. Okay. Now, what we do when you fit one of these models is you kind of put everything in at once. You know, when we were doing some of our machine learning, we did training, we found the new data set, we did testing, and then we calculated accuracy. The nice thing about these is like, oops, sorry, um, cram it all together. Okay. So you say, well, here's our training data set. So the data, the prediction data, the uh, output outcome, batch size, we picked 32. So it's going to do this in chunks of 32 on our thousand uh, samples. Epics is how many times to run the same thousand samples. So, you know, we have this data set of, of 1,000. We're going to run it in chunks of 32, and you can pick um, different numbers. Well, it's 32 and then 128 because of our long short-term memory. So it starts with 32 and then it adds 128 each time um, <clears throat> because of the previous model layer. Now, why would I run the same data 15 times? Shouldn't I train it just once? I've asked this question. <laughs> People learn if you're having multiple experiences, oh, the same experiences, right? So, give you a personal example. I hate asparagus, cauliflower, and broccoli. All of those, most of those green vegetables. Cauliflower is not green, I guess, but um, yeah. Blech. Okay. And so I have learned this through only a few, but several experiences of like it tastes like pee. So I apparently have whatever that thing is that makes it taste terrible. And, um, you know, a couple trials was all I needed. <laughs> but you get the same experience. It's the same trial. Okay. And so when we have these dropout, these dropout pieces, sometimes, even on the training data, you haven't seen them all. And so you pick a certain number of epics to just sort of say, well, you know, people, like right now we're training our dog, to, to you know, sit, stay, lay down. Um, and so we do that same trial over and over again. So people work like this, so models, you know, they gotta see this a couple times before they learn it. How many epics do you pick? Well, um, I always start kind of small, because you can add more, you know. Um, and I watch the loss function. So as this is running, what you should see is the loss should go down. Okay. Generally, across epics, losses go down. Okay. And accuracy should go up. And if that stops being true, then that's the number of epics you needed. Okay. And if you train models until the accuracy is perfect and the loss is zero, almost, you might have overtrained them. They may not predict the, the, the training data. The, excuse me. Testing data set. 
So everything you see here on this side is the training data. So the accuracy is slowly increasing. The very last piece you're going to see when I scroll out here is VAL. VAL is for validation data set, the test data set. And so you can see the loss and the accuracy. And you don't want um, the accuracy to be much, much worse. Now, in the first round, it might be. But like if the accuracy over here is 90% or whatever, and this one over here is 30%, the model cannot generalize. Right? It, can't, it can predict the training data, but it can't predict the testing data, which is not good. So that's epic number one. Let's look at epic number two, and you can start to see what I'm talking about. So um, that's a this is a pretty low loss number to start, but then it's still going down. Accuracy is kind of is overall going up. It's kind of ping ponging around. In general, this is increasing. Let's keep going. Okay. Now we see some. So after two epics, um, we see that the loss has dropped pretty good. Uh, Accuracy is going up. Watch val, val accuracy over here, though. <laughs> so, loss still going down, accuracy still going up. Keep going. Loss going down, accuracy almost in the 90%. Still down, still down. So, loss is starting to bottom out, and accuracy is starting to top out. Okay, that's good. Okay. The problem here is that, as you see on this side, the accuracy is not going up. <laughs> So we can predict the training data, but we're having a hard time with the testing data. We can't seem to get above 60%. So maybe this combination of layers is not the best, because I can certainly predict at some point it really does bottom out here, and I can predict the training data perfectly. <laughs> but the accuracy just still is not good. And you notice that the loss is actually going up. So it went from 0.9 you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and it's actually increasing as we go, which is not good. Um, <clears throat> so I should have probably stopped because at some point this is, becomes a moot point, and I probably should have stopped training. There's no real hard and fast rule here, but somewhere up in here, okay. right, we're starting to hit very good accuracy. Um, but none of these values on the validation data set are getting any better. Okay. So is this model a hopeless cause? Well, I would say predicting binary choice outcome um, at 60% is not that great because that's, I mean, a log regression model on sentiment data, you can get into the 90s. <laughs> so is all the added complexity worth it here? Probably not. Would it be better if I showed it thousands of examples? Oh yeah. So, you know, that might be my choice of restricting the data set. Now, we can kind of summarize that instead of just looking at all the epics, um, where we can tell it to do model.evaluate. Notice that this is very similar to the way that um, the models in scikit-learn run. And so, I'm not really doing that great, but I didn't put in a lot of data. So I can see, I'll put in my test, two test values. And it, so it sort of reruns just the test at the very end of all these epics. Tells me my score. Um, score here, I'm not sure actually what score is, to be, to be honest, because it's not loss. Hold on, let me see if it's loss. It might be loss. Back up. Yeah, okay, it's lost from the last round. Okay, so loss, I, I should have called this loss. <laughs> Test accuracy, 60%. That's pretty much giving you the same answer as the last epic of the data, but this is a nice way to just print it out at the end and see what happened if you don't want to watch all the epics fly by. Um, I know there are some cool ways with... Um, I've seen people do this in R, and I'm sure there's ways to do it in Python where you can print out a little chart that, like, as it's running, it, like, makes you a graph as it's going. I'm not quite that fancy. I just let it run, and I'll look at the outputs. <laughs> All right. So let's try a convolutional network, and we're actually just going to try a mixed model. And the main piece here that makes it convolutional are these convolutional 1D. You can actually do these in multi-D space. 
going to stick with some flat models today. Um, but notice we also have a long short term memory model, a memory layer in here. So this is a mixed or a hybrid model because it has both the recurrent piece and the convolutional piece. So the last one, you know, that, that dense layer allows us to connect you know, inputs to outputs. But now we've definitely got the traditional layers for convolutional networks. And so I just I'm reloading all of these, even though we have some of them already in here. Just so if you pick one of these examples, you have what's necessary. And so notice new package, not the right word, new layers. Can you stop being so loud? Thank you. Um, so we're still doing a sequential model. Uh, we're going to separate our dropout layers, uh, separate the dropout into its own layer, okay, which is kind of nice, and activation as its own separate layer. Uh, we could have done that in the last model, but we built it into a current layer. And then also add the convolutional layers. <clears throat> All right, so I will confess to knowing that you need to define these things, but they're definitely things that you can tweak, right? So there's this kernel size and these filter, there's this filter function for the convolutional part. Again, notice how many of these are kind of like 34, 62, uh, 60, 32, 64, 128, it's computer geeks forever, right? Um, how much of the data around you want to pool for the mapped pooling piece. And so I would say just play with these, see what happens. Um, we're going to leave the embedding the same as what we just did. So this is, you know, our, our kind of feature network, feature one hot piece. Uh, we're going to change the long short term memory output size. And we're going to decrease the batch size and definitely decrease the FX. These mo this model, while only a couple more layers, is very, um, takes a long time to run. And so in general, I would probably run more if I had more time. So notice like the many of the layers here are going to be the same, just stacked together. Okay, we're going to add this dropout layer, a convolutional 1D layer, and a max pooling 1D layer. And this, it's a seven layer model, so it always makes me laugh because it's kind of like a seven layer dip. Okay. And the dropout piece helps us with the overfitting. This is the forgetting function um, because people forget, so models should forget as well. Convolutional 1D makes that sort of a one-dimensional structure. I kind of have a picture here, but remember making convolutional means that everything is connected to everything else. Okay. A max pooling um, is really very similar to what we did for word to vec It takes the kind of pieces around it and like smashes all of those contexts together to create an activation pooled from all those connections. <laughs> and so here's the picture that I stole. Um, and so it has these like feature detectors, so it would run through each one of um, these kind of like chunks at a time, kind of like a word to vec, right? And so the representation of the words are sort of um, uh, are based on the like position and the the word itself. So it builds this sort of like mini little what's the word? matrix, right, tensors, because we're using TensorFlow, um, of, the, of the sentences that we're building. Uh, and it's one dimensional network because we're not working with like 3D pictures, right? So it makes sense to do one dimension because words are like one at a time. I don't know that I think this picture totally explains kind of what's happening, but it's kind of like word to vec with this like window movement. Let's build this model. Now, what order should I put? This is a sequential model, so the order matters, but you pretty much always have an embedding layer first and some sort of dense and activation thing last. Okay. Uh, because that helps you, you know, you know, here's what I am putting into the model, and then here's what I'm putting out of the model. Everything in the middle you could play with. So this kind of is based on the history of what other people have done what seems to work so move them around see if they break um and sort of conceptual ideas of how things should go so the idea of this model is that we're embedding them okay so 
we have these, you know, um, max feature, thousand features um, embedded at um, 15 chunks, right? With an embedding size. Embedding size, I think, was um, now I've forgotten. 128. That's our from long short term earlier. Now, I'm just going to forget some of that. You have embedded it. Now I've lost some of it. So I don't have to put the dropout in the long short term memory. I did earlier. But here, I've just said, well, right away, we've already, like, our attention spans are small and we've already forgotten some of it. Then I'm going to connect everything to everything else. And these are like the default convolutional 1D options. But notice that the activation here is not sigmoid because everything is connected to everything and there are lots of connections and lots of possible words that could come next, so to speak. And so the activation here represents the fact that there are multiple things that could be next. Um, so it's no longer right or wrong. With these two tend to go together because okay, I have my convolutional network. And then now I'm going to pull that piece, pull it together, not pull, but pull. I have a hard time making these clear in my southern accent. Um, now that I've kind of seen whatever I've seen, I'm going to remember the last couple of options. So my long short term memory, just hanging on to the last several pieces. I could add one more dropout layer here or drop out the long short term memory pieces within this layer. And so we've kind of like, here's the new thing. Okay. Here's a couple of the old things. Okay. We're going to now connect that kind of memory to the output. So in comes this stuff. Right? I forget a little bit of it. I'm doing the convolutional type of, of, of work. That gets pulled together. And I've got my memory of my previous stuff. And now what's what am I predicting? And that, to me, like that flow makes a lot of sense because, you know, we have something we bring in. Let's say if we're talking about reading. So we're reading along, we're pulling in the current information and sort of pulling it. Like, here's the context, and here's what I know about these words, and here's my semantic memory. Right. I've created a gist representation. Now let me pile that on top of the other things that I know I've read previously and predict what comes next. So it kind of maps on kind of nicely onto um, kind of like the reading process. Now, it's still right or wrong because we're not predicting reading. In this example, we're predicting uh, sentiment. Um, so the activation is still sigmoid because it's either yes or no, po positive or negative. And then I'm using the same arguments for loss and optimization because the, the, the problem set has not changed. It's still a... a um, to output answer. And let's see how this went. All right. Uh, okay. So we ran two epics, epic one, epic two, and it got mad at me. Um, and then I can kind of look at, uh, I made the batch size bigger, or the, the it's now running at 300s. And that's just so it would run faster. And so we would hopefully what we'd see across running more epics is that the uh, loss would continue to decrease and the accuracy would continue to increase because right now these are not very good. Um, but it kind of looks similar to our last model. So if we compare these two, are we getting anything extra by adding all these extra layers? And so that's what I always want people to ask themselves when doing these models. Am I getting gaining anything extra by making this so complex? Because, you know, there's a lot of, of hype around these. People are really interested in them. They're really fascinated. But that level of complexity can be very costly in computation time for, for a business, okay? or for me even, like, I don't want to run 15 of these for lecture notes. <laughs> i got better things to do, right? So, um, you know, 
that sort of complexity adds cost. So making sure the cost is worth it. Can I actually predict above and beyond a simple, you know, support vector machine model? All right, so let's look at accuracy. Um, so accuracy on only two epics, this isn't, I guess, terrible, but I still should show up more examples and more runs to see, excuse me, um, if I can get above basically chance here. So you could program things directly in TensorFlow. So there are like entire books on TensorFlow and Keras and both. Um, so I recommend checking out, this is from the textbook that we're using. There's a, a chapter with some examples in Jupyter notebooks on how to run some of these models. Um, but it don't, it's slow, it's very slow. Uh, and then in a minute I have another example from the book. So let me end with predicting text. Now I will totally tell you that I took this from a um, one of these machine learning websites and I think it's really cool and their example works way better than mine because they train the model appropriately. Right? So uh, it's about creating Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland is kind of short so you know I did a different example I think. Um, so mine is not very good, but it walks you through this whole thing a little bit more than I have time for. Um, and this is the whole thing put together and actually works a little better <laughs> than what I'm about to show you. Okay. But it is a super cool example that I think maybe you can think about how you can expand that to something you might need to do for work. So I'm just going to grab all the negative movie reviews. So I'm trying to see if I could build, potentially, if I did this, ran this more, could I build a bot to go in and just slam any bad movie that I don't like? Right? So can I build something that's going to write bad movie reviews? And that has a lot of, of potential, not good, but potential uses. Right? Because if I can build models that create negative reviews or positive reviews, I can use maybe that information to help me find and identify the fake reviews. Like Amazon has this problem, right, of fake reviews. Um, or paid for reviews, that kind of stuff. All right. So I'm just grabbing all the text. Okay. And I don't have very many of them in here. So I have 250 of the bad reviews, and I've just, like, collapsed them all together. Now, one problem with this data set is it's over many, many movies. Um, so the context specificity is not very good, meaning that the bad review could be include a lot of words that are very um, predictive of bad reviews, like I hated it, but it also has a lot of words that are predictive of that movie individually, like, um, you know, pick your favorite movie that you hated, and talking about the characters. So um, I would say if you're doing this kind of stuff, having more context-specific examples for the training would be better. All right. So let's just grab all of these uh, models. And specifically, I want to focus on uh, how to save models. Because if you're running a bunch of models and you've got better things to do, like you're running one on your lunch break and then you need to go back to work, model checkpoint is your friend. I'll show you how to use that. So in this example, instead of using whole words, they used characters, which I think is an interesting choice. But you could program this to um, grab entire words. So here what we're trying to do is, given the current set of characters, what's the next character you might expect to see? As opposed to, given the current set of words, what's the next word you might expect to see? But you could extend this model to do that. Um, but by using characters, we're actually increasing the size of the training data. So that's why I think it's an interesting choice. So all we're doing here is just grabbing what are the possible characters. Okay. So there are, you know, 39 different characters in this data set. 
so clearly we got some some interesting punctuation going on because I'm like trying to figure out where we got 39s but all the numbers and the punctuations I guess for you know our 26 letters plus some other stuff and so instead of going for 250 reviews times about maybe um, 100 words per review would only be like 25,000 words by using characters we've increased our data training size to 210 so you know that's why I think it's an interesting choice and there are 39 characters to choose from so this stops being a binary problem of positive or negative and starts being a multi-class problem pretty quickly okay, so another reason why this model isn't great is because I'm trying to train it to predict between 639 different characters and I have given it like two inputs so you know more training would make this model maybe better maybe and so um, now I have to prepare the data so what we did before was we just padded the sequences like grab 15 you know move on if it doesn't quite fit 15 make it 15 by adding some zeros on the end and then there's a thousand of these by 15 okay. now I've got to like actually like make the sequences myself so this um, code here basically kind of creates those sequences so it's going to look at a hundred letters and grab a hundred letters so that first hundred letters is the um, input the output is the next hundred letters so pick it up one and move over one so the next hundred letters so then we're just doing that you know input 100 letters output next 100 letters input 100 letters output next 100 letters so we're mapping this on one to one so we've got inputs and outputs and that's all this is doing is creating those sequences out of the data so we could do this with words we could say here's the first six words here are the next six words you know the next word to predict is this next category of six words so it would predict words rather than characters. Now, the, the, that's our inputs and our outputs, but we need that to be in a mathematical form. So what I have right now is just two columns, X, which is our words, um, our 100 characters, and Y, which is the answer. But I gotta convert X into some sort of mathematical form which is one hot encoding, which is basically what we did before was we padded this, you know, we, we made this into sequences of 15 on and on. And this is kind of creates this into a binary sequence. And that's kind of like dummy coding that we've used before. And that is um, two categorical instead of dummy code, I think was the code we used earlier. Now this normalized thing here just allows us to deal with that sparsity, sparse matrix thing. So this kind of controls for the, the size of the vocabulary. All right, now let's put in the model. Okay. So the model is effectively kind of that original small model, right? This is a long short-term memory model, so we've got sequential. Okay. Now interesting thing here is I didn't do an embedding. And I find that kind of interesting, but the reason that we didn't grab the embedding is because we've done the embedding ourselves. So we've done the, the embedded part by creating this one hot network. You could have a second embedding model, but instead we just grabbed our long short term memory with, you know, the 128. Uh, the shape here is this is X and this is Y. So like it's figuring out like what kind of, of encoding to expect. So this is the number of training pieces by the number of the width, which is 100. Forget some stuff. Okay. Now on to the outputs, dense, a dense layer. Okay. And the output needs a shape as well. So we have 39 different possible outputs. Okay. And because that output is not 2, <laughs> we... Um, have to give it some sort of activation that allows for it to to pick between all the different options and hopefully softmax is familiar from last week 
because solid maximums are, are um, options that Word to Vec tends to use, where uh, you see all of these different contexts and these different it picks from the you know given all these contexts, here's the likelihood of you know this particular one. And then I just compiled it all on the same page. So now our loss function also mirrors that our activation is different. So instead of um, binary cross entropy, we're using categorical cross entropy because we have more than two. So most of the work still, and nearly everything that we've done, most of the work is like putting it in the model. And then the model runs fairly quickly. So data screening always takes forever. Now let me talk specifically about saving these things can be very slow very very slow so what you can do is tell the models to save if you know like hey this is going to run for a while and I, in case anything crashes also a problem uh let's just keep save it after each epic okay. so here's what that does okay. so i'm going to save the models and here's the names i'm going to give them i'm going to say what epic it is given it's a two-dimensional so zero one zero two zero three loss which is a uh, four point float number, so it's a decimal. Okay. And then this is the type of file it is, an HDF file. Okay. Now we've got checkpoint here, so our model checkpoint, save that model, monitor the loss, because we're going to stick the loss in here. Um, verbose equals one, so yes. Uh, save best only, true, and mo, I actually don't know what this one piece does. And then we're going to call back to that last checkpoint. So what we do is now we fit the model. So we've compiled it, now we're going to fit it. So I fit it to X and Y. This is my input sequences and my um, answer output sequences. I ran this five epics with a batch size of 32. And this is the important piece, the callbacks list. So what the callbacks list does is it says find that checkpoint. And so it calls this checkpoint function that um, uh, you know calls this file path and so it runs each epic and saves it. So you end up with a couple of files on your computer and it creates you a list of possible checkpoints to open when you fit the model. So I think you guys can see that in the zip file but you can see my three my five models. Now, I'm going to pick the best model, which was the last one, because I really need to keep running this. And so if I think if we look at them, you can kind of see, yeah. So here's the loss. Loss is going down, but it's not a good number. Okay, we want that to be lower. So I should keep running this to see if I can get loss to come down. Um, and I can check accuracy at each stage as well. But to load whatever model you're interested in, you just put in the file name, you tell it to load those weights, and then you do have to recompile it. So anytime you're loading previous models, you do have to say recompile. So let's use dot evaluate now and see what happens. Okay. I bet if we did a dot evaluate, it would be really bad because this model does predict very strangely. But essentially, what I'm going to do now is give it some inputs and have it tell me the outputs, which we have not done yet. Okay. What we've done is looked at how good it was predicting. But here's the, the next piece, right? So given these inputs from our characters, um, what, what are the outputs? Okay. So I grabbed a random input, and I say, you know, print out the random input. So coastal town, at least we know the monster motives, uh, thing never learn, never able to change shape, able to make blah, blah, blah. Okay. So this is the 100 character input a random one. And then let's see now, given this input, what output we might expect. So given this 100 character input, let's make 100 new characters. And so all this stuff basically kind of reshapes data, predicts, okay, so it's model.predict. So predict the next character. And then it returns basically kind of translates back from a one hot to the original data. And then it sticks that character on. 
So we have our first 100 characters. What's the next one? Okay. Now that we have the next one, shift everything over one, including our prediction. What's the next one? Okay, shift over one, shift over one. So we're taking in its, the model's prediction and using that to predict the next one. Which is very similar to the way that um, Google's autofill or even Siri's autofill feature works. Right. So, you know, given that I've typed I, oh, let's see, what's a funny one? Um, I am a. So, there was this thing on Twitter for a while that went around where you were supposed to type the thing on your phone and then pick the middle every single time with the predicted text. This makes it sound like I never leave Twitter. I actually spend more time on Reddit um, and BuzzFeed. But, you know, let's say I'm trying to make a predictive text joke. And I'm picking up my phone and I'm saying, let's see, let me text my friend Katie, who's crazy. Okay, I am A. And then if I pick the middle one, it says, um, I am a little tired, accurate, of this, also accurate, bug. Not accurate, but it seems like a good game. <laughs> so, you know, it's using the last input, you know, the last several inputs to predict the next one. So, this is the same way that these models work. First hundred words, okay, here's my um, characters, here's my output, move over one. Okay, and now I have the last 99 and my new input, move over one. And so that's all that this code is doing. Um, however, the output, the output that it creates is not very good. So it just like republishes. I have only trained this once. If I trained it again, I would probably get a different answer. But we do get the word movie, which is a good prediction because there are going to be lots of the word movie is going to appear many times. But um, by doing this by character, we're going to get some uh, things that are not legal, that are not words. <laughs> okay, so I don't, I don't know. Spent, maybe? Close? Sent? I don't know. So like I said, the model's not very good. But if you were, read the original example, and they do some actual good training with it, um, you get something that kind of looks... It has some examples that uh, Alice in Wonderland that kind of makes sense, but it still predicts some some words that are not real. <clears throat> All right. So let's summarize everything. Okay. So very very brief intro of deep learning models, okay, and I just really want to give you an overview that this can be used for text. Um, I think it's overkill for sentiment analysis, honestly. But uh, you could use it that way. I've used it to help me predict categories of, of types of text. So, it, you know, what type of text could this be? You could use these kind of examples for things like hate speech. Um, or, you know, we've talked a lot about classifying tickets into your help system. Okay. Um, and the best way to learn these is just to play with them. Unfortunately, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort, I think, um, because, you know, if a model takes 45 minutes to run and you got something wrong, you know, there's another hour you got to spend fixing it. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, a sub time cost on these kind of models. Um, we did some very simple examples to show you a sequential, a sequential, a sequential model uh, using recurrent neural net ideas with long short term memory layers and convolutional layers. And then we Kind of, I showed you like a, a structure for character generation that you could expand into word generation. Um, and with the right type of data, those models can run pretty well. Now, I want to end with great job. Okay, we have learned 12 to 14 weeks worth of stuff. So every week we've done something different. And the goal of this class is to really expand your toolkit into thinking about how. I can apply traditional statistics to language, so regression, log regression, right, cluster, that kind of stuff, but also some more descriptive statistics like um, with the vector space models and similarity and these models and word to vec. And so you've learned a lot of stuff. Congrats, you made it to the end. Huzzah!